Real quick, before we dive into Acts 8, turn there in your Bibles, if you would. Um, David Kosan, uh, was, uh, he shared the word with us last week. Great job, David. So he's not even here, but we're going to give him applause anyway. So David, uh, boy, he made my heart, heart proud. I sat through two services because I love Jesus. Um, but uh, he did a great job. If you missed it, uh, check out thechurchesaverb.org. We post all of our messages on there. So if you ever hear a message, you're like, so-and-so needs to hear this message, just go to the website. You can share it. Uh, we make it pretty easy to do that. So, uh, so I appreciate David pitch hitting. And just real quick, by way of note, tonight's dinner is invite only. So I know they announced it. So if you're not part of Doug Thrasher or Kevin Levitt's deacon group or mini flock, uh, don't show up. I mean, it's a free meal, uh, but we'll kick you out, honestly. So we got Brian McGee and, and Johnny P on bouncy security tonight. So you don't want to mess with those guys, right? Flex? No? Okay. Acts 8. Turn your Bibles there. This is the kind of morning it's going to be, just FYI. So here we go. Uh, Acts 8 is where we're going to turn to. Uh, we get a look at a, uh, a magician, a sorcerer, someone who is a master illusionist in the Bible. In case you didn't know, they're there. Uh, just side note, I love magic. I'm one of those guys, like, at an early age, I used to love watching David Copperfield make the Statue of Liberty disappear. Remember when he did that? And it was, the whole thing was that people were on a set, right, that turned and they were facing New Jersey and so, whatever. Uh, David Blaine. David Blaine's an interesting guy, right? Like, you watch, you're like, how the heck does he do that, right? Penn and Teller, one of my favorites. Um, I have a story about Penn and Teller, but I won't, I won't, I'll share it for a future date. I love this kind of stuff, right? Like, I have personally learned a handful of magic tricks that, you know, whether it be a card trick or some sort of illusion, there's just something about doing it that mystifies people, right? And people are usually like, how do you do that? How do you do that? And, you know, I'll pay you. Teach me how to do this trick. It's, it's pretty amazing, right? Now, it's even a little bit more amazing, and I would say deceptive when it starts becoming a little bit more occult-like. You know, there's people who would say they can speak to the dead as almost like a form of, of supernatural ability, right? There's people who would say, you know, they attend, uh, hold a seminar and say, hey, if you want to connect with a departed loved one, come and we'll connect with, with them so you can hear their voice. And people long for this stuff. Um, I remember one time a, a woman walked into Sozo and she's a fortune teller palm reader and she can tell people's future, right? And she walks in and she says, would you be interested in having me tell the future for customers? I'm a fortune teller palm reader. And I said, well, just to let you know that I don't believe you have that power because I'm going to say no. And if you would have known I was going to say no, you wouldn't have come in here in the first place. <laughs> Touche. She left here like <laughs> whatever, right? Isn't that fun? Like seriously, like you know I would have said so I don't believe in your gift. But people believe in these things. People are attracted to these things, right? And the people that possess these abilities claim to hold a special power or ability. Now, what's incredibly deceptive is when that cut creeps into the church, right? That there are in churches people who claim to possess abilities that others don't have. And they can usually use those, they usually use those abilities to bring sort of a, a manipulation and authoritative control that's not necessarily healthy. This is what we see in Acts chapter 8. If you would turn there, and, and, and Luke, who's writing this account, is giving us a picture of this guy who you're going to meet. His name's Simon. They call him Simon the Magician. Like, I'm, I'm Scott the coffee guy. That's my name, right? Here's Simon the magician who becomes a part of the church, but his participation in the church isn't genuine. Meaning, could it be that a lot of people who are part of church aren't really necessary? They may be in with the church, but they may not be in with God. And I, and I think this is why Luke gives us Acts 8, because this week and then next week, because next week we're going to meet the Ethiopian eunuch. <laughs> so, so we've got Ethiopian eunuch, we've got Simon the Magician, a whole wonderful cast of characters, right? And I think what Luke's doing here is as the gospel begins to expand, which is the mission of the gospel, given to us by Jesus himself in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world, right? There's going to be this outworking of the gospel. 
Luke wants us to know you're going to encounter false faith as well as true faith. Right? Not everyone who's in is really in. And that's who we meet with Simon the Magician. So we get a warning. Here's what false faith looks like. Next week, we'll look at what true faith looks like with the Ethiopian eunuch. And so... We come to this text, and uh, I'm sure it's a text that some of you have read, and you just kind of read and scratch your head and go, what's going on here? And it's interesting as the gospel goes out, it, it reaches all different types of people. But just because you profess doesn't mean you possess. That's probably one of those Scott Morganisms, Scott the Quoter. So I'm no longer Scott the Coffee Guy, I'm Scott the Quoter. Um, just because you claim to know Jesus doesn't mean you really know Jesus. And, and, I, and I know this is sensitive ground to, to, to walk on because um, we, lo we look at this guy, and, and from all appearances, it looks like this guy is a believer. But what we have is another first in the book of Acts. We actually have the first false believer in the church, Simon the Magician. The concern isn't you know, someone believing, it's, it's what are they believing? What are they putting their trust in? What are they putting their faith in? When you spend time with a person, you really begin to understand what their heart really longs for. But unless you spend time with someone, for, even over a period of time, you'll just kind of take at face value what their life's about and may never really know what they truly love and hunger for. How do we differentiate between false faith and true faith? Well, I'll tell you what one of the mechanisms, mechanisms God uses is persecution. See, it's easy to follow Jesus when he's popular. It's a lot harder to follow Jesus when you're persecuted for following Jesus. Right? I'm not so concerned about you guys following Jesus during the feast. How do you follow God when the famine hits? I think we've seen that over the past couple of years as a society and a culture. I've seen people who I thought, man, they're in with God. And I'm like, I don't know if they're in. Because when difficult times come, when your faith is tested and tried, what rises to the surface? Right? Persecution's happening. Believers are being scattered. True faith is being revealed. Now, here, here's the, the comfort I take in, in preaching this message. This is one of Jesus' favorite talk, topics to talk about. How do you differentiate between false faith and true faith? So unless you go, boy, Scott's very judgy today. That's how you're just being judgy. No, actually, Jesus constantly was saying, I'm going to tell you a parable about wheat, wheat and tares. I'm going to tell you a parable about sheep and goats. I'm going to tell you a parable about salt and, and, and darkness and light. And um, what's another one? So, seed and soil. I'm going to tell you about the broad road that leads to destruction, the narrow way that leads to life. It's almost like Jesus says, hey, you're either in or you're out. There's, there's no gray area, and I'm going to tell you right now, and Jesus is the one who says this, there's probably more people on the broad road that leads to destruction than there is in the narrow road that leads to life. Could it be that there are more people who are not in, who think they're in, and that ought to shake us to the core? That ought to, shake, that ought to concern us. And, and, at, and behind the scenes is the work of a devil who uses one of two tactics. He, either he will try to devour or he'll try to deceive. And this falls in the realm of deception. How do we know we're in? And, and, this, and I pray, you know, this week I'm going, Lord, I want to love the church, and I want to bring the truth to the church, but I also realize that it is going to be the truth, your seed of truth that's going to fall on our hearts. Where are we at? Because someone here may be so challenged and convicted, you thought you were in and you're not, may today be the day of salvation. For those that are in, and the words today go, it resonate with your spirit, and you're like, it's, it's, it's confirmation, right? And as you guys have heard me say, you know, my role is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted. So that's what I'm going to do today. So here we go. You guys ready? Acts 8. Turn there. Verse 9. Um, Philip has left Jerusalem because of persecution, and he's going to Samaria, which is an area populated by half-Jewish people. They're not pure Jewish. Hence, there's prejudice and there's racism. But the gospel's going out. 
right? The gospel's not for Jews only. Woohoo! It's for, it's for Gentiles like us. And so the gospel's going out, and it's going out because of persecution, and then the guy named Philip steps up and says, I'll take it to Samaria, and everyone's like, good luck with that. But the Samarian, Samaritans need to know they're included in the, on the gospel, just like all the other nations of the world. So Philip goes out, and he's performing signs and, and, and wonders, and people are coming to know Jesus, and exciting things are happening in Samaria. And then we pick up the, the continuation of this in verse 9. Now, there was a certain man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. So he's got a little bit of an ego. <laughs> Would you say that? Circle that phrase, right? Dangerous when you proclaim to be someone great. And they all, from the smallest to the greatest, the least influential to the most influential, were giving attention to him, not making matters worse because they were calling him the great power of God. Now you're doubly damned, right? Because you think you're all that, and everyone else around you says, you are all that. Woo! We're going to talk about that. Verse 13, uh, verse 12. But when they believed Philip, so Philip comes into town, preaching Jesus and the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. And even Simon himself believed and was baptized and started hanging out with Philip and he observed signs and great miracles taking place and was constantly amazed by them. So, so right off the bat, right at the surface, we go, oh, the magician of the city the one they called the great gift of God <laughs> has come to believe in Jesus. Can we all celebrate that, right? Well, let's continue, because if you stop there, you go, he's in. Uh, let's, let's see what comes out of this man's life. Verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria was receiving the word of God, they sent them Peter and John. Why? Because they're the thugs of the church. <laughs> no, just kidding. They came... Because they wanted to authenticate that the gospel was indeed changing lives outside of Jerusalem. Just like God had promised in chapter 1, verse 8. So the apostles, the main dudes, these are the original BFFs. There's, uh, Peter and John were always doing ministry together. It's awesome. They come to Samaria. They come down and they prayed for these people that they may receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them at this point, but simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they began laying hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, let's just stop right there, because I could spend a whole message on the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Spirit. Um, just so you know, what is being described here is not prescriptive for all of church ages, but is descriptive for this soul moment. Meaning, what we affirm is that when you come to believe in Jesus Christ, you're given 100% of the Holy Spirit immediately. It is only because God waits to give the gift of the Holy Spirit is to authenticate the gospel going outside the bounds of Jerusalem, because the same thing is going to happen when it goes even beyond Samaria to Gentile territory. So the book of Acts, first 10 chapters, is a book of the transition of the gospel moving from Jerusalem to Samaria to, to the Greek world. And so when they come and they lay hands and they give them the Holy Spirit, it's to authenticate their leadership, Peter and John, but it's also to communicate unity that these Sumerians are part of the church so that racism and prejudice is done, done away with. Full stop, period. We're done. Not with the message, but at that point. Verse 18. So when Simon saw that the Spirit was being bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands... He offered them money. There's a new trick that I don't have in my bag I need to pay for and get this trick. That's essentially what he's saying. And he says, give this authority to me as well so that everyone on whom I may lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter says to him, may you and your money go to hell. That, that's literally what it says. Some of you have the, uh, the G or PG rated version of the Bible. This is severe. What Simon is asking for is serious. The response Peter gives to Simon is severe. May you and your money go to hell. Because you thought you could obtain the gift of God, circle that phrase, grace, with money. 
You have no part or portion in this matter. Your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray that the Lord, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven to you. Whoa. So at one point, we thought maybe Simon was in it, went in. Now you're looking at Peter's rebuke and going, I don't think this guy knows. And then you get his response, and then Peter continues, for I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the bondage of iniquity. I'm just saying, don't love somebody maybe with those words quite yet. You've got to earn that, that right, right, to speak those kind of words, severe. And then look at Simon's response. But Simon answered and said, pray to the Lord for me yourselves so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. And then verse 25 says, and when they had solemnly testified, spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and began preaching the gospel to all the other villages that were in Samaria. So God was continuing to work even though they've hit a little bit of a speed bump with Simon the magician. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts today. Five things I want to cover with you. Um, and I'm going to tell you that there's going to be some passion involved. Uh, there's going to be some, um, there's going to be some, maybe some snarkiness uh, a little bit. Um, there might be a little bit of yelling today. There's going to be a lot of sweating. I'm already, I'm already doing it. Um, but, but the heart of what I want to share with you is, is because I want your heart to be in the right place with God. I only want you to leave here having the assurance that you're in with God. But we have to talk about faith. Why do you believe what you believe? What are you putting the object or attention of your faith? What are you being amazed by in your, in your life? What's, what's the heart connected to or not connected to? This comes out in this passage. So five things. First one being this. Uh, we acknowledge that there's the necessity of faith, but there's also the danger of prestige. Meaning, here's a guy, Simon, who's got everything he wants. He has no need of God. Do you know people in life so successful, so affluent, so well off, they don't need God? It is difficult to preach gospel of Jesus in a very affluent culture. Look at verse 9, verse 10. Here's this guy. He, he's living a good life. He's being paid for what he, he, he's doing, right? People, he, he has his own ego, right? I'm a great person. He's got everyone around him saying he's a great God, He's tapped this special knowledge and ability to keep people amazed and astonished. Notice the language. They're astonished, and they're giving attention to him, right? He's got prestige, but the problem with prestige is you cannot keep up being prestigious. It will eventually come to a dead end. What was hot today will no longer be hot 15 minutes from now. Can I get an amen on that? We know this from social media. We know this from pop culture. We know this from music, whatever. Like, I'll mention actors to people, and they look at me like, who's that? I'm like, they were 20 years ago. They're amazing. Now they're nothing. You ever have that conversation? That's when you begin to really go, I'm old. You mention someone to somebody, and they're like, who's that? I'm like, are you kidding me? Right? People live for prestige, right? They live to, to have their reputation stroked and their egos fed and and they become so well known and so well off, right? The danger is this. They don't feel like they need God. They've got enough small g gods in their life, they don't need the one big god, god interrupting things. So there's a necessity of faith with all people because eventually prestige wears off. So here's this guy. He's a celebrity. He's a god among the people. He loves his great reputation. He's feeding off public ad admiration, right? But, but Luke is setting us up for something profound and powerful. And it's that until you come to the end of yourself, you'll never appreciate the love of God in Christ. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Until you realize you are nothing, you will never understand God is everything. I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I've always wrestled with this, and I still wrestle with it. And I was at a pastor's conference in April where, where God really lives, and that's Louisville, Kentucky, so they say. Uh, you guys don't, okay, whatever. Um, Paul, who we would call a super apostle, <laughs> this is like, talk about celebrity Christian. He says this, and when I came to you, brothers, 
I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. I'm coming to you with a message, but I'm not going to lean on earthly talents, oratory skills, charisma, whatever we want to add to the mix. I'm not coming to you with that. For I decided to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. And as we, and as with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. Can you imagine the super apostle Paul coming and saying, I've renounced all worldly things that make people amazed and astonished. Why? Because it is about Jesus. And if anything robs the glory from him, it becomes a false gospel. This is why Luke is giving us this detail. Because if you don't glorify God and you're seeking self-glory or self-gain, you're going to end up empty, you're going to end up frustrated, you're going to end up mad because you believe the lies of the world instead of embracing the truth of God. Point number two. It's the eagerness of faith and the danger of popularity. So as I already mentioned, right, Simon's reputation is fed, uh, it's feeding his ego, which then pushes him to pursue more and more popularity. You know, he's got his social media manager saying, you got to pr- push this, promote that, you know, uh, pay for more subscribers and fans and, and whatever. And, you know, the quest for popula- popularity becomes this insatiable, unquenchable drive that cannot be mon- maintained forever. Eventually you tap out and say, I can't maintain this because someone's going to come along that's better, that's newer, that's prettier, that's more successful. This is the danger with popularity. Two things, we attach ourselves to that which is popular and it may not be biblical, or we ourselves strive for popularity and end up at a den in the street empty and frustrated because we hitch our, our wagon to that, that post. And so look at verse, verse 12, right? So he's doing this magic. He's known as the great power of God. Think about that. Only God is great, amen? So this is what, so Philip comes to town preaching that message. So Simon's already got a stronghold on the city. He's the great one of God. Philip comes in and says, We're, none of us are great. Only Jesus is great. Competition. Rivalry. Who's going to win out in the end? I'm going to tell you right now, Jesus always wins. There's the good news. If, if you go to the end of the book, Jesus always wins. And I will tell you this, the things of God will always be more exciting than the things that this world offers. As much as Simon offered an exciting product, nothing is more exhilarating than a divine person who's come to love you and sup with you and drink with you and party with you and live with you, and dwell with you. But yet people are eager. They're eager to go to what's popular. Just because something is successful or popular doesn't mean it's of God. We have to be careful. It, this, whether we're talking Mormonism, whether we're talking Islam, you know, I mean, these are fast-growing religions. They're very, very popular. doesn't mean they're of God. And even within Christian circles, just because there's a church that's growing by gangbusters, you've got to be careful. Did you hear six fights for Jesus has been established in Scottsdale? I sit there and go, beware. That's, that's my funny way of calling big churches. <laughs> or did you hear about that church in Chandler that serves coffee? Beware. <laughs> it sounds good, doesn't it? I'm going to hit you with a latte and then give you the lordship of Jesus later. <laughs> Here comes Philip with the newest and the most exciting thing. And you got to be careful. The devil has been baiting his hook for centuries and knows how to, how to get you, your eyes on something to be enamored by and to be tantalized by and something scintillating. And, you know, it's like, oh, you know, people go, did you hear that new, there's that guy who's got this new book on this revelation, this new, and I sit there and go, question mark, red flag, a warning. There's nothing new under the sun. That's what the guy's been talking about in Ecclesiastes on Friday morning. It's just the devil, once again, working in the church, trying to deceive people. Verse 12, look at this. Philip comes preaching Jesus. Simon believes. 
he's baptized, and he starts belonging to the group. At this point, we think he's in. But they're not talking about Simon anymore. Here's the deeper thing. His star has been eclipsed. There's someone more popular and successful in town. His name's Philip. So what does Simon do? If you can't beat him, join him. So he joins them. He's eager to join them, but for what reason? Now, I'm going to fast track and give you the end of Simon's story real quick because it's not in the scriptures. We go, what happened to Simon? After 20, verse 24, you're like, what happens to this guy? There's no, there's no mention of him repenting. There's no mention of him turning. There's no mention of him coming back to history records. Simon takes his circus... Because that's essentially what it is. I mean, it's like, hey, come see Simon, the great one of God, the magician, tell you everything you want. It's like a circus, right? He ends up in Rome. They build a statue to him, and he becomes the greatest arch villain for the early church, a forerunner to Gnosticism, the very thing that was trying to destroy the church the first few centuries. This is how we know he didn't embrace true faith. He becomes the church's enemy. And, and begins this Gnostic, if you're not familiar with that term, term, this is really good, Gnosticism was one of the main enemies of the early church because people were claiming special knowledge of divine things that you weren't privy to, only they were. So you became dependent on people to have a secret connection with the universe, with the deities, with God, whatever, and you would pay them and trust them and they would use this power to manipulate and abuse and bring a, a horrible authority over people's lives that was never biblical. And I'm going to tell you right now, don't ever follow someone who claims a special power. That is dangerous. Someone who says, God has gifted me with this ability to see visions that no one else can see and understand things in the Bible. I remember there, there was this Bible knowledge, th Bible code thing that came out years ago where they said, yeah, this is what your Bible says, but there's deeper meaning deep down inside. Unless you're like me, you'll never understand it. And I sit there and go, BS. That was the Greek way of saying, you know, baloney. We are so eager to hear something that, that we want to hear that we often put aside orthodox faith and, and belief and, and go after something that's very false, very spurious, very, something very inauthentic. So this is what happens to Simon. He hitches his wagon to that which is popular. And I'm going to tell you right now that the greatest enemies of the gospel have always been those who were once believers in the church. Because when people taste, witness, participate, experience, are astonished, and yet their heart is never transformed by the gospel, they get to a point where they're depressed, disillusioned, dis discouraged, distracted, whatever D word you want to use, and they leave, you think they're going to come back? This is exactly why Hebrews 6, write that verse down, uh, chapter down, look at it later. According to Bible expert scholars, is probably the most difficult chapter in all the Word of God, Hebrews 6. Because it says there are those who have been enlightened, there's those who have tasted the heavenly gift, there's those who have participated in, in miracles, but it is impossible to renew them again unto repentance. And you look and go, it's impossible, meaning are there people that hit a point of no return? And the writer of Hebrews says, yes. Look at Israel. They followed the pillar of cloud by day. They followed the pillar of fire by night. They ate the manna that came down from heaven. They drank the rock that Moses struck a stick on, and they drank from it. They followed Moses, and yet they did not enter the promised land. Why? Because they were disobedient, and they never believed to begin with. You think you're going to win them back somehow, some way, when you led with everything but the gospel? The gospel becomes unattractive to those who have tasted and been enlightened and have seen and participated. I talk to people 
who used to be pastors, used to be church leaders, and they have walked away from God. Why? Because they were never told the gospel. They were sold, hey, come to something so exciting. Come to something so astonishing. Come to something that is going to wow people, flying llamas and big screens and charismatic pastors, and they are given everything that would be like mind-blowing to, to every. but they're not given the gospel. And I said, I don't want to be a part. I don't want to be a part of that. I, I want people to know Christ, but I'm not going to give them something that's less than the gospel. Jesus never backpedaled. The rich man comes to Jesus and is like, what do I, must I do to inherit, inherit eternal life? Jesus says, obey all the commands of God. He's like, hey, I got that. And then Jesus says, go and sell all you have and give to the poor. He turned and wept because he want, didn't want to give up on his possessions. Jesus didn't go, oh, no, no, stop, stop, stop. Did I say that? No, I, I didn't mean that. Jesus doesn't do that. Because until we come to the end of ourselves and are re ready to renounce everything, even Jesus says you cannot be his disciple. <sighs> You know, we got to be careful, especially with celebrity Christianity. I'm, I'm excited that there are, there are people of notoriety who have come to know Jesus. Can you think of anyone, anyone recently who's come to know Christ? Justin Bieber? Kanye? You know, and you get, you get this polarized group, right? You get the people like, no, he'll no, that's not true, right? Or you get people like, yeah, glad that he's in our camp, right? But here's the problem. We're so eager to shove these people into the spotlight, right? Oh, if they could do so many great things for Jesus. I'm going to tell you right now, Justin Bieber can't do anything more or less than what you can do for the gospel. The problem is how quick we are to take the celebrityness of them. Is that even a word? I love making up words. Celebrityness. And use it somehow for the gospel, and I think we're setting them up for failure. And that's why you have some famous people who walk away. They didn't, we need to treat probably, the, the more public a figure is, probably the more isolation they need to start. Super Apostle Paul, remember him? He comes to know Jesus, and then what does God do? He sends him into the Arabian wilderness for three years to remind him, your work is not based upon your fame, reputation, notoriety, ego, prestige, popularity. Your life will now be based upon making Christ known and boasting in him and nothing else. Let's be, let's be, let's be slow in, in catapulting people into the spotlight and let's be zealous in walking with people in discipleship, spending time with them, really focusing on what that gospel work is doing in our hearts. The more public a figure is, probably the more private they need to be developed. I just made that up on the spot. Is that good? I think that's good. Write that down. Point number three. So Simon, um, we, we, we then get like this pause. Let's go over to Peter and John. Hey, they're coming up from Jerusalem. They're going to Samaria. The inclusiveness of faith and the danger of prejudice. Why does Luke include this because two things one is the gospel is going out and it's going to go to very un-jewish territory and that's okay because there are people that are not like us that need to be included in jesus's fold can i get an amen black white men women republicans democrats those who drive foreign cars those who drive domestic cars those who have you know two left feet and those who don't you know whatever everyone is in within reach of god's love and grace right? The gospel is inclusive. That doesn't mean everybody's saved, who God chooses to save. That's up to him. But we are to be communicators of the gospel to all people. Luke, we went through Luke. The gospel's for everyone. That's the message. Acts, gospel for everywhere. We go everywhere, people, tribes, nations, people, tongues, doesn't matter. All people need to hear the gospel. But here's the thing. God needs to continue to work in the hearts of people, their prejudices, and you want to know who of the two, the worst you know, people, most racist people, most prejudiced people are in this? Peter and John. 
And guess who gets to go to Samaria? Peter and John. May I remind you, John was the guy who went to Samaria at one point, came back because the Samaritans pretty much closed the door on him, and he says, hey, Jesus, is now the time to rain down fire upon the Samaritans and, and destroy them? Has anyone ever wanted to rain down fire on your enemies? Uh, the psalmist uh, writes those kind of prayers. They're called imprecatory prayers where you want to destroy your enemies. And it's almost like, I'm glad the psalms contain psalms like that, but you are never to embrace that attitude. <laughs> it's okay to say, I really hate them and I want you to destroy them. And God says, settle down. <laughs> Vengeance is mine. You go love them. So John goes to Samaria to the very people that shut the door on his face and who he wanted to call down fire. So God's got a lesson for John. <laughs> And he's got a lesson for Peter, and Peter doesn't even understand at this point because it isn't until Acts 10 when he's at Cornelius' house, who's a pure Gentile, that God begins to work on Peter's heart and says, yeah, everyone's included. So these two BFFs who are just so closely knit together, Peter and John are going up to Samaria, and they're like, all right, we're going to go witness, and they witness the transformative work of the gospel. And they lay hands the Holy Spirit baptizes. Again, descriptive, not prescriptive. The reason is that the Samaritans needed their own Pentecost, just like the Pentecost that happened in Jerusalem. Something miraculous, something powerful. It authenticated the apostleship of Peter and John, but it communicated something more, the unity now that the Samaritans are included in on the gospel. Ladies and gentlemen, no one, is beyond the reach of God, the, the grace of God. Amen? May we be ready to share with anybody and everybody the gospel. How dare we come with an attitude that says, yeah, they'll never believe. Oh, they'll never accept Jesus. They'll never change. Like, you underestimate the true power of the gospel message. Right? We believe that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, Jew first, then Gentiles, Romans 1.16. There it is. So stop judging and just start speaking. Start loving. Start sharing. Point number four. Is that where we're at? I get excited, guys. Sorry, and I lose track. Okay, here we go. Back to Simon. The desire of faith and the danger of power. Here, here's ultimately the question. When the gospel takes root in your life, what do you want more than anything else? What do you desire? What do you hunger for? You look at Simon's life and go, I don't think he wants Jesus. I think you look at Simon's life and go, he wants more power. He wants more popularity. He wants more of a, a, a sideshow so that his reputation and ego can continue to, to just be grow astronomically. Like when you spend time with a person, and this is really what's required, time, you really be, begin to see what this person's passionate about. This is what's so desperately needed among small communities of believers that they get to live life together. This is why I love meeting with guys Friday morning. I love our Friday morning group. We, we talk and we share, and the more time you spend with somebody, the more time you're just like, man, I, I really love that guy. I love what's coming out of his heart and his spirit and what he's sharing, and, and you really get it. And then there's some people you meet in life, and you're just like, they say they love Jesus, but I never hear them talk about Jesus. I never hear them being astonished or amazed at the grace of God at work. That's why... It's why the bigger a communi Christian community is, the harder it is to walk with people and get that. I, I know why people avoid smaller congregations. Why? It's like, ooh, they're going to get to know me. If you have the Spirit, you want to be known. You want that accountability. You want that sort of discipleship relationship. You don't want to hide. Right? So what do you desire? Here's the danger. Power. This is what Simon wants. Look at verse 18. So Simon sees what the apostles are doing. He's like, I want that power. And he offers them money. He says, whatever the price, I want to learn how you do this, this, this magic. Now, the, there's a part of me that says, 
I almost wish Peter, not really, but Peter doesn't go, hmm, how much money are we talking about? I can show you a few things. You know, I, I, got, a, I got a chariot I need to fix. I got some kids I need to feed. He doesn't, right? You know why Peter severely rebukes him? Peter's been on the same path as Simon. Peter's pursued power for selfish reasons. Peter's pursued gain for personal advancement. Hey, Peter, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and die for for your sins. No, you're not. (laughs) Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Have you ever been called Satan by God? You know you're in good when when he calls you Satan. Peter, he's been to the cross. He understands what seeking power for your own selfish pursuits is all about. And so Peter knows the dead end road that Simon's on, and that's the way he rebukes him. He says, you are being consumed by a narcotic that will never give you what you want, power. And he says to to, to Simon, you are preoccupied with material things, and you need to be desiring spiritual things. You're boasting in yourself, and Philip's been boasting of Jesus. You can't boast in both. I even love what Paul says, right? I'm going to boast in Christ and Christ alone. There's even a sin named after Simon that's come to us today, and it's called simony. Anyone ever heard of simony? You've heard of simony? Simony was the practice that was adopted by people, especially in the Middle Ages, of you being able to purchase church offices, church positions, and church benefit. And the Roman Catholic Church capitalized on it so they could build their huge, magnificent cathedrals. And then the Reformation comes along and says, what the hell are you guys doing? And I, I think that's how they said it. You cannot purchase the things that are purely given because of God's grace. Simony, look it up for all you church history nerds. Simon wanted to perform. He wanted power. And Peter says, stop. You are no longer in control. If you're in Christ, you're no longer in control. You are no longer in the driver's seat. There's none of this, God is my co-pilot. I hate that. Simon comes right out, and, and then Peter comes right out and says, you need to know Jesus, and you need to know his word, and that's it, because no power or prestige that you want can, can replace that. Even Peter, when confronted by Jesus, and Jesus says, are you going to leave me, Peter? And Peter says, where am I to go? You're the one that has the words of eternal life. Like, Simon doesn't understand this. He thinks it's Jesus and him, and that's the gospel, and you need to be careful of gospel and meet conversions. You've heard me say gospel is Jesus plus nothing. Well, it's dangerous because the message is still being communicated out there that it is Jesus and you conversion, meaning there are people that we interact with. There's people in this church that I had meetings with, and I I have to love. Boy, there's times I want to be the, you know, you want to whip the sheep. You can't whip the sheep. You got to generally lead the sheep. Um, you know, they'll meet with me and they're like, you know, I don't agree necessarily with what the Bible says. And they come at it as if the Bible's a book of suggestions or best spiritual practices. And I just sit there like biting my nails going. <laughs> and, and Gallup polls just this past week came out and said there's a record low 20% of Americans that now say the Bible is the literal word of God down from 24% five years ago and half of what it was at its high point in 1980 and 84. Meanwhile, new 29% says the Bible is a collection of fables, legends, history, and moral precepts recorded by man. Marks the first time significantly more Americans have viewed the Bible as not divinely inspired than as the literal word of God. The largest percentage, 49%, chose the middle alternative roughly in line with, uh, with where it's been in previous years. This says to me, The Bible's a book of suggestions, but I'm ultimately in control of my life. You can show me whatever you want from God's word. My heart tells me otherwise. I even had someone, I I, I had to address something in their life, and they end up texting my wife about our conversation and says, I'm not going to believe a man with a Bible in his hands. 
and I'm going to still pursue my life. You know, I'm so calloused and apathetic. I, since I gave up hope, I feel a lot better, guys. Just, just be, no, I'm just kidding. Some of you are like, wait, what? I'm going to love. I'm going to show grace. But I've given up trying to control even how people either want or don't want the Bible. I, I, I just share, and it's got to be the Spirit of God. It's got to be God who works. All I know is I, you'll n- n- never hear me say, turn to the story of David and Goliath. I never use the word story when it comes to the Word of God because the Word of God is not a story because we hear story, we think fable, myth. I always refer to anything going on in the Bible as a narrative or an account or an event in history because the Bible is a history book, but it's so much more. If we truly believe 2 Timothy verse 3, 16, 17, the word of God is God-breathed, given to us, and profitable for teaching, correction, reproof, and, and training in righteousness. I believe the whole word of God is, is given to us by God and is the greatest owner's manual on how to live our life and perceive the world and understand the love and grace of God outside the physical work and the personal work of Jesus Christ. And this is why we, we open the Bible, and there's people that come and visit, and they're like, oh, you guys actually open your Bible here? And I go, where, where do they not? You know, you get churches like, like we're going to look at Enneagram number six today. Um, oh, today we're going to be looking at the, the love language of gift giving. How's that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and say, I said, if your time in a, in a church gathering doesn't center itself on the opening and proclamation of the scriptures and the gospel, that's not church. You've got Oprah's book club. You've got the Christian bestseller like discussion board. Here we are, right? Like, no, if the word of God is not central and that the lead pastor is not the worship leader because worship is more than just music, worship is the opening of the scripture, understanding the gospel, seeing the presence of Jesus all over the pages and him being exalted and there's nothing else, you're not a church. Am I allowed to say that? I don't care if I'm allowed or not. I'm going to say it. Because I truly believe it. If, there's a Jesus and me mentality that people say, I'll, I'll, come to need, I'll come to know Jesus, I'll accept Jesus, and I'll, I'm going to let him influence m- most of my life. But if at any point he says something to me that I don't believe in, I reserve the right to exempt myself out of things I either don't want to believe or don't want to do. And let's be honest, we're, we all dabble in this territory. What if, what if, you know, someone came to me and said, you know, Scott, just to let you know I love you and I'm glad you're my pastor, but just so you know, I believe 99% of what the Bible says. I'd be like, hmm, okay. Well, which part? And they basically say, well, no, I just reserve that 1% that's kind of a moving target, so whenever I don't want to submit and believe it, I don't have to. What if my wife came to me and said, honey, do you love me 100%? I'd be like, I love you 99%. My wife's going, what? <laughs> what does that mean? Have you been faithful to me 99% of the time? Now I'm, I'm really in the doghouse. All right, here's, here's what the gospel demands. It means death to myself and death to everything that I want. It is purely what God wants now for my life. That's the gospel. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. The, the demands of Jesus are severe. Jesus didn't backpedal. We shouldn't backpedal. And if Christ isn't Lord of all of our life, he's not Lord in any part of our lives. And my wife's not here, and she hates when I say that. So I say it to her 99% of the time. I reserve that 1% to say, you know, it's date night. I don't need to lay that on her tonight. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? Like, we do not reserve the right to hold any sort of control over any part of our life that we don't want to submit to God because whatever you're holding on to that you haven't yet submitted, that's truly your God. 
That's what you desire. You say you desire Christ, but your life doesn't demonstrate it because you're following a small G God, and I don't know what that God is, addiction, sex, power, uh, uh, prestige, you know, whatever, home ownership, car ownership, no ownership. I don't know what it is. But if you desire something apart from Christ, the thing that you desire is become your God. And Simon's a guy who doesn't want Jesus in his life. He only wants the control that he's able to have that comes in the name of Jesus. Do you want power? Here's how you become powerful in God's army. Turn from your sin, ask for God's forgiveness, be filled with the Holy Spirit, walk in humility and serve one another. The least becomes great and the great becomes least. You want power? I heard rewind. Turn from your sin, ask for God's forgiveness, be filled with the Holy Spirit, walk in humility and serve others. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Check this out. Peter says this, as each of you has received a gift, and this is what Simon's asking for. He's for, asking for a gift. Here's the good news. Everyone in the church has been given a gift by God. You don't need to pay for it. It's been given to you because of his grace. Woohoo! Use it to serve one another. Notice Peter doesn't say, use it to serve yourself. Use it to serve your plans. Use it to serve your purposes. Use it to serve your selfish agenda. Use it to serve your kingdom. No, no. You use whatever God has given you to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks to it is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves to it is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. There's a power. The power doesn't come from you. The power comes from God through his spirit and gives you the capacity to do what he wants you to do in line with his will. And then he continues and says it this way, in order that everything God may be glorified who's exalted who's extolled who's celebrated who's adored who's worshiped who's astonished who's amazed it is god through jesus christ to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever amen do you do you feel the passion of what peter's writing he's saying you want power stop seeking it and surrender and submit and watch what God is able to do in you and through you without you even thinking about it because he, you're so yielded and you're so given over to what he wants to do. And the end result, you know it's of God, but this has nothing to do with you and it has to do with the name and glory to boast in Christ and Christ alone and his. That's it. What are, you, what are you desiring today? Why, are you, why do you want Jesus? Why do you want to be here? There's part of my desire that's like, I don't want to preach this message. But God has to say, no, you need to. Because more than anything else, I need this message. This is not about me. This is about God. If I boast, I'm going to boast in Christ and Christ alone. I even hate when people are like, I told someone the other day, where do you go to church? I want to go to Scott Morgan's church. And I go, no, don't say that. This is not my church. That's why as hard as it was, I was able to give up a church that I had started. It wasn't my church. This is, this is God's church. And I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be that guy. It's like, no, this is not about me. This is about us, and this is about Christ, most importantly. What's, what's God doing here? Two points, real quick. The character of faith and the danger of praise. Um... So here's the deal. You understand where this man's faith is by what he asks for. How can I pay for this new trick? How can I pay for this power to lay hands on people so that the Holy Spirit does what I want the Holy Spirit to do? And Peter says, (laughs) with as much grace, I guess, as he can muster, you and your money go to hell. Um, I've actually had to have conversations like this with people. Big players in the community, big givers, come in and try to manipulate things and by using their wallet as the mechanism. I wish I would have used this phrase at times. And there's times, no, I need to be a b- more pastoral, I guess. Uh, there's a story. So Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, first mega church pastor, 1800s, was invited by P.T. Barnum, Barnum and Bailey's Circus. You guys remember circuses? Oh, there's a generation that knows not circuses. I feel sorry for them. So P.T. Barnum heard about the success of this preacher and said, I'm going to invite Spurgeon to America to preach at my circus events because it's going to attract more people. So he sent a letter 
to Charles Spurgeon. He said, here's the pitch, right? I'm going to offer you whatever music you want, or if you don't want music, that's cool. Any equipment, any manpower at your disposal, the freedom to speak as long as you want or as briefly as you want. The only catch is that I will keep all profits from the gate tickets and return compensate you $1,000 per sermon honorarium. Now, at this time, that's a lot of money. And it was a generous offer, and, and Spurgeon goes, wow. He saw through Barnum's offer, and he sent him this reply. Dear Mr. Barnum, thank you for your kind invitation to lecture in your circus tents in America. You will find my answer in Acts 13.10. Very sincerely yours, Charles H. Spurgeon. <laughs> now, some of you are like, what's Acts 13.10? It basically is in line with Acts 8, verse 20. How dare you think you can purchase the gospel with your measly money. Isn't that awesome? I, we don't know if Barnum went and said, fetch me a Bible, what does it say? Spurgeon would never compromise the purity of the gospel for some money. And may we be careful to have the same mind. Let me, let me share a phrase with you. God's free gift of grace is not God's cheap gift of grace. God's grace cannot be earned, merited, begged, borrowed, stolen, or purchased. It is a gift, and it stops being a gift the moment you think you can earn it. God's grace is not deceptively transactional. It is deeply transformative. You like that? Isaiah 55. I love this, this verse. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me. Eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me that your soul may live. Notice we, we are using words that are like bread and milk and wine, right? The things that physically satiate our appetites, but there's a deeper thing going on with Isaiah. He's talking about our soul and what's the greatest cure, what's the greatest food, what's the greatest thing our soul needs, that God makes an everlasting covenant with us. Is that good news or what? See, we think we can buy when God says, no, no, no. What I offer you, you can't buy because I would never want you to buy it because then who gets the glory at the end of the day? You can say, I have what I have because I purchased it. You've got to come to a place of such contrite brokenness and humility to receive what God offers in order to celebrate. You never knew how hungry you were until you realized how much you don't have to buy, which truly satisfies your soul. Don't even ask me to repeat that. I don't even know what I just said. <laughs> Here's the thing. Isn't it just like God to say, you have been created with this capacity that only I can satisfy? Right? Ecclesiastes says, he has set eternity in our hearts. We know there's something more, and the things of this world continue to disappoint us. And that's why he says, stop. Stop flexing. Stop trying to be all that and think you're going to buy. No, no. The moment you relish God's grace is the moment you don't deserve it. You realize you can't earn it. You realize you don't. God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we're at sinners, God dies, sends his son to die for us. What? Grace earned is miserable grace. Grace offered freely is a grace that keeps us humble. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Grace moves us into humble faith. It moves us to hard work. It moves us to sacrificial love. It moves us to have hearts continually enthralled with his grace. That's why we talk about the grace of God. And it's the grace we don't abuse. I don't take God's grace for granted. All I know is it just keeps me humble. How about you? Last point, we're done. The sensitivity of faith and the danger of pride. So it's interesting, I just used the first Peter verse on God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So here's what we have going on here. Where's this man at? He's been confronted. He's been severely rebuked. What do we know about this man's heart? What we know is that he was never saved to begin with. He professed but never possessed. 
Look at verse 24. Simon answered and said to him, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. There's no concern for what he's done. There's no brokenness for what he's asked for. The only concern was avoiding judgment rather than getting right with God. Let me put it this way. True faith says, how do I receive God's pardon? False faith says, how do I escape God's punishment? Conversion doesn't happen in the heart that says, I'll take Jesus if it means avoiding hell. True faith doesn't happen in the heart of someone who says, I want Jesus because my mom knew Jesus and she's dead and I want to be reunited with her in heaven. True faith happens in the heart that recognizes its sinfulness, its disobedience, its rebelliousness, its wretchedness, and is broken and understands it brings nothing to the table but recognizes the beauty and the majesty of what Christ has done for them on the cross. His righteousness for your unrighteousness. When you're sensitive to that, it, it strikes down pride. There's nothing you bring to the table. You're dead in your trespasses and sins, but God makes us alive in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2. Woohoo! First service didn't get that. You guys got that. There's, there's worldly sorrow, there's godly sorrow. What you see with Simon is a worldly sorrow. Oh, I've been caught. Can you guys take care of all the spiritual damage I've caused? Godly sorrow? I'm responsible and I messed this thing up. I need to turn to God in repentance and ask for his pardon. That's why Jesus leads the Sermon on the Mount with this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. We're broken. We fall far short. And we cannot do enough. Good news is you don't need to. Stop. Surrender. Wave the white flag. God, I need you. God opposes the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. Simon goes on to become an arch villain in church history. When he's confronted in love, and sometimes the seriousness of sin requires a rebu- severe rebuke, but the results are in God's hands, you guys. The results are in God's hands. God will choose to turn whosoever's life around. He, needs it. he allows Simon to continue in this perpetual state of disobedience, and he becomes an arch enemy of the church, but the gospel still grows and expands, and lives are still changed. Verse 25. And then next week, we get to meet a man, Ethiopian eunuch. We don't get to know his name. The eunuch. We get to talk about him. And some of you are like, what's a eunuch? We'll talk next week. But true faith, in light of what we just talked about today when it comes to false faith, but be encouraged. I don't know what God's speaking to you today. I don't know how he's working in your heart this morning. But here's the good news. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Praise God for an amazing Savior. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thanks for being with us today. It is so wonderful for you to to be in this place among your people. Boy, what 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 a passage to navigate. There's some truths here that we all need to, to hear. And, and for some of us, maybe it's all of them. And for some of us, it might be just one thing. But thank you for your faithfulness in reaching your people. Thank you for your faithfulness in planting seeds in those, those areas that, boy, we, we've taken too much pride in. We've taken too much 
ownership of. We've, we've tried to be in control, and Lord, you've invited us into a life where we just continue to surrender. So move in our hearts. Grow the, the seeds you've planted so that Christ is proclaimed and nothing else. That we can go out and we can share with all people the wonderful news that we don't have to bring to the table anything. God, you've done it all. But then in response to you doing it all, we want to serve you to the utmost. Find within us pure hearts and pure motives to do that. Thank you for your faithful work among your people. Thank you for this church collective. So, so, so wonderful to call them brothers and sisters in Christ. Give us wisdom for the journey. Give us grace to show all people. And thank you again for being a God who's in control of all things. Thank you for loving us in Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day. See you soon.